screen, right? Yes. Okay. So thank you for joining this uh, NMRG virtual meeting. So the May meeting, I would say. Um, so as uh, Laurent put in the chat, uh, please just add your name in the uh, ATOR pad so that we can keep track of people here. Uh, just let me remind you a bit uh, the goals of the IRTF and so as NMRG is a research group, uh, as uh, you should, uh, we, are, uh, we are not directly conducting standard development. We are more focusing on long-term uh, research in this group as the IRTF group, research group. And just as a reminder, So also you should know that uh, that you are following the IUTF policy. So please uh, have a look now on this that is reminded at each meeting. And uh, I would be uh, how, uh, how, how the meetings and uh, how we work in IUTF groups. Jerome? Um, yes? I cannot see your slide anymore. You cannot see my slide? No. Hello? I don't know if it's the same for others, but uh, I just see your login screen. Oh, we, we don't see the slide. Okay. Let me reshare. Okay, yes, it's... it's been, okay, let me share the full screen. Maybe it will be... Just to be clear, we go, now, now we start to see something. Yeah, now, now we see the slides. Okay, good. So to address the reminder about the uh, IETF policy here, and so you have all the, the reference, you have the, uh, the different policy and code of conduct and all the, the different processes and so on. So what is also very important is for virtual meetings that uh, we have kind of uh, rules. Uh, so the third thing is uh, that uh, uh, to ensure that uh, you, uh, you don't have your video activated, that you mute yourself when others are speaking, just to avoid uh, strange and disturbing noise or echo. Uh, important is that uh, from the last meetings we started, uh, from yeah, to the two last meetings we started to record the sessions. I think, Laurent, you activated the recording as I see. So, yes. uh, just to let you know that uh, yeah, the meeting is recorded and then will be available and will be put in minutes so people can uh, replay the meeting. Uh, and so, in addition to minutes itself. Of course, when speaking, uh, please, uh, please, uh, uh, yes, if there are many people who wanted to speak, just raise your hand and uh, state your name, uh, just to be sure that we know who is speaking. Okay. So the links uh, are here that you can also find in the, uh, in the agenda. Uh, the today's meeting. So, as I said before, yes, if you go to the heat of that, just add your name now, and that will help us then for writing the minutes as well. So, for the agenda today, so after this short introduction, we'll do a, an update of the of the group and status and uh, on the, the different points and meetings of the group. And then we will have today uh, one technical presentation from uh, Jose Suarez on graph neural networks for networking. Uh, and then we have, we have different discussion. Uh, and uh, that's the main objective of the meeting today is to have a discussion of the different um, items we have in our, um, um, in our uh, agenda uh, in the group. So one on the uh, net uh, artificial intelligence uh, challenge document that, uh, that I will uh, summarize what are the last progress and how we'll continue. And also to discuss a bit some ideas that have been exchanged in the shared document. And then we'll, uh, we'll go into the uh, different item of IBM, uh, in particular those that uh, are in the next in the um, the work plan that is defined in the uh, charter of, uh, of the group. 
and also we'll uh, discuss the uh, uh, internet classification graph at the end and uh, then it will be the end of the meeting so uh, is that okay for everybody or some, uh, someone want to, to, to comment or add something to the agenda if we can okay, that's fine so we'll go with the first presentation let me open the, the presentation from Jose. Okay, hello everyone. So I will share my slides. Okay, if you want, as you prefer. If you can share, yes, it may be easier. I just need to stop. Okay. Uh, can you see them? Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Thank you, Jose. Uh, Jose, I will let you add to start. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me also to present uh, this work here. So I'm Jose Suarez Varela. My name is and I'm at the end of my PhD program uh, at uh, the Barcelona Neural Networking Center. And I will present a, a work that uh, we jointly did with these people that you can see also in this slide, which is entitled uh, Fast Prototyping of uh, Complex Graph Neural Networks for, for Networking. So first of all, uh, I would like to to discuss about uh, what are the main characteristics that uh, a design uh, or a, an AI solution for networking uh, needs to have to be uh, to be a commercializable uh, product. So basically, uh, if we have uh, if we want to commercialize a product, uh, it, we need uh, to develop it in the in the vendor's lab or uh, in the networking lab. And basically, we can have a control testbed and then an artificial intelligence model that can be a, a neural network. So in this, uh, in this scenario, what we can do is to train this model, and then uh, this can result in a, in a final product. But then this final product uh, should be deployed in the, in the customer's network and, and operate uh, well. So, the main barrier that uh, we find uh, with traditional AI solutions for networks is that uh, they are not able to generalize to other networks that didn't that they didn't see during the during the training phase. And basically, uh, when they operate in this, if, if you apply this uh, final product in the in the customer network, the AI product will fail to operate well. Uh, so basically, it is uh, it has uh, issues to be commercially viable, uh, commercially viable product. Uh, another alternative would be to train uh, directly the AI tools in the customer network. However, this is unfeasible since it would require uh, network instrumentation and also uh, in optimization solutions, it may cause uh, service disruption due to possible wrong configurations applied to by the, by the AI, AI solution. And also, uh, it's not feasible to replicate for every customer uh, the network uh, in a networking lab to train the, the AI product. So I would like to, to, to claim here uh, that uh, it's, to have commercializable uh, AI solutions, it's uh, necessary to, to have AI models that are able to generalize to other networks that were not seen during the training phase. And in this context, uh, the recently proposed graph neural networks uh, were the unique AI-based models that were able to generalize to other networks that weren't seen during this uh, training phase. So, it, uh, for example, in recent works like the like CrowdNet, the one you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, it achieved a generalization of different topologies, routing configuration, and and other elements such as the such as the traffic in the network. 
So with this kind of models, we can perform an offline training on, on control test bed in the, in the vendor's lab and then create a final product that uh, can operate successfully on any customer network. So this, uh, in this uh, context, uh, graph neural networks uh, has the necessary characteristics to be a commercially viable AI solution for, for networking. However, uh, considering the uh, DNN-based uh, solutions, uh, one issue is that uh, there is the necessity to create custom graph neural network designs for different or to operate uh, uh, in different networking use cases. Uh, for example, to, to optimize the configuration in a quality of service software and network scenario, uh, such as optimizing the routing configuration in your network, or other uh, typical networking scenarios such as optical networks, including modulation and spectrum assignment, or uh, more modern uh, paradigms such as virtual network uh, function uh, scenarios. So each use case in the end requires to make a mathematical formulation to represent all the different network elements that are involved uh, for this particular use case. And these elements should be uh, represented in the form of graphs. So at the at the right, uh, you can see, for example, uh, the the mathematical formulation of RoundNet, which uh, is not a uh, uh, simple uh, formulation. So it includes uh, some elements like the topology, the routing configuration, the traffic, and uh, it uh, it can be extended to other elements such as security policy and other depending on the networking use case. So what we see is that uh, we need uh, machine learning experts nowadays uh, that have high skills on neural network programming, including or considering some uh, languages uh, such as TensorFlow. So the main motivation of, uh, of this presentation is that to boost the adoption of graph neural networks applied to, to uh, networking, it is essential to simplify uh, the implementation of uh, fast uh, DNN prototypes. So this serves as, a, as an introduction to the framework I will present today that is called Ignition and is a framework for, for fast prototyping of uh, graph neural network models for network AI applications. So basically what is this uh, framework? This is a, a generic framework where you have you can have a network use case, and it uh, it uh, assists uh, users to create a custom graph neural network architecture, particularly adapted to this use case. So this is an easy to use uh, DNN toolbox for networking researchers and practitioners that do not have a specific background on uh, designing a neural network uh, solutions. So the, the main motivation to, to present this framework is that nowadays, if, if you want to, to design a first DNN prototype, you have to deal with, uh, with uh, programming in, in some tensor-based languages like uh, the well-known TensorFlow, PyTorch, or the more novel uh, approach of Huawei uh, Minesport, but all of them are based in complex uh, tensor-wise operations. So if you want to create your own DNN design, uh, you will need to deal with this kind of complex tensor-wise operations. And also you will have a lot of problems uh, because of the complexity to debug your code in this, in this kind of, uh, of languages. And here I show as a small code snippet where uh, a small portion of uh, DNN architecture is uh, is implemented in the form of, the, of these complex tensor-wise uh, operations. So in the end, uh, we face a steep learning curve uh, when we want, want to implement uh, uh, a first DNN prototype. So how it works, how works this uh, the ignition framework? Basically, first, uh, you, you need to define your networking use case and the main elements involved. Like, for example, I want to optimize uh, the routing configuration, the security policy, 
and I have some target metrics such as uh, improving the network performance or detecting uh, or, or making anomaly detection. So then uh, the ignition framework will assist you uh, by offering a network, network abstraction to define the GNN architecture adapted to this uh, networking use case. And finally, this framework uh, automatically generates uh, a TensorFlow code with the, the implementation of, of your graph neural network model. So you are completely oblivious of this complex uh, uh, programming in TensorFlow. So uh, to show the, how, how is the workflow for, for users, uh, Basically, a, a user can develop uh, its own GNN solution in three simple steps that are the ones that you can see here. Uh, first of all is to create a GNN model description, then migrate uh, the data set to, to a standard JSON format, and finally, uh, executing the training and evaluation of your GNN model. So going through the first step, uh, to, to create uh, the GNN architecture, which, which is the most complex part of this process, uh, we offer a very uh, easy JSON uh, interface to create, uh, to create this. So you can abstract from all the mathematical uh, uh, elements of, of the graph neural network. And uh, in, your, in this case, uh, we offer a network abstraction where you, you can describe uh, the network elements that are involved in the networking use case and the relations between them. For example, to define the routing configuration in a network, you can define a link, uh, the, the link uh, element and the path element and define relationship between end-to-end -end paths and links. And in this context, we provide a template um, and detailed uh, documentation to fill uh, this, this template and create the, the GNN model. So the second step is to migrate the, the data set to JSON. Basically, uh, in this case, uh, in networking use cases, uh, data sets have uh, very different structures depending on, on how you generate and gather, gather the data. So what we do is to provide an, a standard JSON interface that is easy to, to be migrated or to, to migrate your data to this, uh, to this uh, format. And finally, once it is migrated, uh, you can easily fit uh, your GNN model with, uh, with any data set. So once we have the data set uh, and the model architecture, uh, the, third, the third step will be to, to train the, the model. And basically, you can do it with, uh, with two lines of code, particularly for training. And then once you have also your model trained, you can use these two lines of code to, to evaluate and execute the training model. So uh, compared to TensorFlow, where you can have hundreds of lines of code, here you have only two lines of code and an intuitive uh, JSON interface to define your, your GNN model. Also, we provide an advanced uh, debugging tool where you, you can visualize uh, the architecture of your graph neural network model in an interactive graph. So here you can see some examples where we show some, some snapshots of this uh, interactive graph with different parts of a graph neural network model called uh, RoundNet. And as you can see, it's, uh, it can help uh, to to know how it's the GNN internally. So in the end, this uh, framework also includes some, uh, some properties and characteristics to identify potential errors and also assist users to correct, to correct uh, them. So just to recap the main advantages of this, uh, of this framework, uh, uh, the main advantage is that uh, you can make a fast GNN prototyping uh, particularly targeted for, for networking practitioners and researchers that do not have uh, any background on, on TensorFlow and other related uh, languages. So from our experience, we can see that, or we could see that uh, uh, when you want to start with uh, TensorFlow and, and these other languages, it can take uh, some months to create a first GNN prototype. And also it's very difficult to, to debug it. 
while with our framework, with just a few hours, uh, you can create our first GNN prototype and run the, the training of the model. Another advantage is that since it is uh, intended to, to create uh, GNN prototypes for networking, we can uh, support a broad variety of, of uh, elements related to, to networking use cases. And finally, uh, it includes uh, this uh, easy debugging uh, property. So uh, the main objective of this framework is to bridge the gap between the networking and AI communities to create uh, GNN-based solutions. So uh, additionally, uh, we provide a public repository that where we are adding some state-of-the-art uh, graphical network models uh, that were already applied to networks, like the ones that you can see here as an example. Um, I think, or we, we claim that uh, that progress in an education in artificial intelligence cannot occur without uh, this kind of public repositories, including uh, implementations and data sets. So this, uh, these public repositories should serve as a good uh, material for, for education and ad advancement in, in general. Uh, here uh, we have a, a first uh, open source implementation that you can access uh, at this link. Uh, finally, uh, I would like to, to give you some updates on, on a on a challenge that we are running now that is called the Graph Neural Networking Challenge. So uh, the problem that we, we devise for this challenge is that uh, we, are, we accept a neural network uh, models where you have a, a input, a network topology, a source destination traffic matrix, and different uh, network configurations, uh, considering different routing configurations uh, and key scheduling policies. And, uh, the model should, should predict uh, the mean per packet delay on each source destination path of, of the network. So to this end, uh, we provide uh, a data set that is uh, simulated in, in Omnet++, uh, plus plus. that includes uh, several topologies and hundreds of uh, configurations of routing, use scheduling, uh, and traffic matrices. And basically, what, in the evaluation part of this challenge, what we want is to test the, the generalization capabilities of the neural network solutions proposed by the, by the participants. So what we do is that uh, in the training data set, uh, we uh, include samples simulated uh, in two particular network topologies. And then uh, we test uh, these solutions on samples simulated in a third topology that uh, should be unseen during, during the training phase. So the objective is to, to test the capability of these solutions to make good delay, delay predictions in this uh, third uh, unseen network. The target uh, audience uh, for this challenge is, uh, is uh, for uh, networking practitioners and researchers, but also from uh, machine learning experts from the AI community. And in this context, uh, graph neural network is nowadays a hot topic that is attracting uh, much attention. Uh, we also provide some resources to, to facilitate the participation, such as a baseline model, including a tutorial, and an API to easily read uh, and process the data set. And finally, we engage participants by using uh, a mailing list. Um, all this challenge was uh, organized as part of a broader challenge called the ITU IAA ML in 5G challenge. So you can check more details. Uh, at this link that you can see here, where there are some other challenges from, from other companies uh, and universities. So I would, uh, I, I would uh, like to take the opportunity to encourage participation and, and dissemination. Uh, now the challenge is uh, open to, to all participants uh, around the world. 
and it, it will take uh, around six months. So it will end uh, around November. And then there will be a final conference where uh, some awards will will be, will be given to the to the winners of the challenge around November and, and December. So this is uh, all. Uh, if you have some questions or doubts, uh, do not hesitate to to ask. Any question? So maybe I will start uh, this, this question. Um, so maybe you can solve this, this uh, challenge. This is what you introduced last. Uh, what what the, the actually the um, uh, participants will provide to you? They provide the uh, neural uh, network model. I'm not sure to uh, understand the input. That you, they, they will have. That was. I I I can't uh, hear you properly, but uh, I think that you are asking about the input of the neural network uh, solutions. Uh, it's more what the uh, participant will provide to you as a solution. Will. So so they they will provide uh, uh, neural network models. So the idea is that they can implement any any model based on on neural networks that uh, should have as input uh, to the topology the traffic and the and the configuration of the network and the output should be this uh, the mean delay uh, estimated on each source destination pair so the idea is that uh, we will give at the end of the challenge a test data set where that is unlabeled and they have to to, to label this data set and send us the, the labels so we can compute the, the score of these solutions. And basically the score of these solutions is based on the on the on the error between the the ground truth uh, obtained by our network simulator and and the labels of the of each participant. Okay, so, so you they have to use a particular format for the for the model? Yeah, we we will use a CSV format, a comma separated format, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, they they don't have to send us the the solution, just uh, the output of the model, and then once uh, all the solutions are in a in a scoreboard or in a ranking, uh, we will analyze the top five solutions. So we will ask, we will request the the solutions to to check that they comply with all the rules of the challenge and, and that they are, for instance, based uh, fundamentally on on neural networks. I have another question regarding the, the work you presented before the challenge. Uh, you present so it, the, your, your solution and you have a small example on one slide uh, where basically you said you just need to describe as a JSON file uh, the, the network and uh, the problem, I think. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah. Well, well, the idea for for this first edition is that uh, we provided a, a baseline implementation in TensorFlow, uh, yeah, but uh, in the next edition of the challenge, uh, we plan to to incorporate the, this framework so participants can use the framework to to develop their own solutions. Yeah, I, I was more uh, asking what, what to put in the first step. I mean, not in the challenge, in the uh, ignition framework. The gen framework you present, I think, in step one. Uh, yes, where well, you put the GNN model description, and then you have yeah, you have an example. I think next slide. Uh, if you can, because I think when uh, it's very interesting because you say that basically you can. Uh, I mean, one challenge actually is that uh, it's hard for non-expert people to uh, to design. I mean, to define the GNN. 
and it has to be adapted to each kind of uh, use case or objective. But uh, I'm not sure to understand in, the, in your model description how you can somehow describe the objective of your model. Like you say, it can be a uh, quality of service or uh, whatever, but what will you put in, in this uh, description, basically? Well, the, the idea is that uh, you can uh, have uh, this model. So the, the objective will depend on the output values in your, in your data set. So here you define the inputs, the outputs, and how, how, uh, how is the GNN implemented uh, inside? So how is the internal architecture? So then uh, once you train your, your model, uh, you need to, to, to include a data set. And, and this model uh, will, will learn uh, based on the, on the samples of, of your data set. So, uh, for example, in the case of Rounded, if, uh, if, you, if you want to predict the source destination in delay, uh, your data set should have these output labels. But also, uh, in the case of uh, directly optimizing models, uh, you can integrate these kind of solutions with uh, some optimization algorithms, and some uh, more novel uh, solutions such as deep reinforcement learning, and then your model can uh, directly uh, learn uh, the objective function to, according to a target policy in the network. Okay. I think there was a, a question uh, in the chat. In the chat. Okay. So, uh, Alex, do you want to, to ask a question yourself, maybe? Well, I, I can see the, the question in the chat. So, uh, how can I know if the neural network learned correctly about an optimized route? Uh, so basically, when when you are training your your model, uh, this is uh, this is part of, of TensorFlow and other uh, languages. You will have you will see the evolution of, of your loss function, and the loss function is basically a metric that tells you uh, how accurate are the predictions based on the on in your in your data set so uh, you can consider some thresholds for for the, this loss function and once uh, the the error of this model is uh, is quite low or is uh, sufficiently low you can consider that it, it, it is able to model uh, all the all the of the samples and usually one methodology to, to achieve this is to separate or to split your data in training uh, validation and test uh, data sets so uh, to comp uh, the the accuracy of your model usually you train the data set in some specific samples and then evaluate the accuracy in other samples that weren't seen during the during the training phase for example, in the case of the of the challenge, what we propose is uh, to train the model in two in two network topologies, and then uh, we evaluate it in a in a different topology. So, if it's accurate in this third topology, it it was able to to generalize at least to uh, this to this uh, unseen unseen network. Okay, I see. Do you recommend using the PCA? Well, uh, I would say that in this process probably is, is uh, not necessary, but maybe it can be useful to to analyze uh, the all your features, your input and output features in advance. But usually in this process, uh, the graph neural network model and in general uh, neural network solutions are able to to uh, to learn from your data and also uh, it's not necessary to to make a previous analysis on on the data
Okay, th thank you, Jose. I think there is no other question. But thank okay. you again for the for the presentation. And so uh, I think it's good that you make also some advertisement for the challenge and people are willing to participate. I think the, it should be it should be nice as well. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to, to this forum. So let me return back. Okay, so I'm going back because I think I skipped a slide uh, before the presentation. We, uh, so I'm sorry for that, but I wanted just to introduce you the future meetings that we will have in the group. Uh, so as you know, uh, the IETF in, uh, in Madrid uh, will be uh, online. Uh, it will be uh, cancelled on site. So uh, we will uh, follow the uh, guidelines that we receive for the group. If, so if we want to have a we have a slot for virtual meeting. I mean, virtual meeting during the, uh, the the agenda of the IETF should be for uh, Android main session, a single one. That's the recommendation. I think that's the maximum we can have. Actually, um, it's a good, a good time because uh, at that particular time, I mean, July and July and uh, July, we have a set of. Uh, work item I mean, and milestones, uh, in particular regarding uh, uh, AI challenge, but also I think IBM architecture and uh, a new document for the architecture. Of course, uh, in research group, uh, milestones are not as strict as in a working group, but still they are good, um, they are good to be there just to recall us also and to, uh, to help us to all, uh, a bit stimulate and uh, and the activity of the group. So I think it's it's good to, to have this milestone in July, even if it's very short, uh, not regarding the delay, but it's good to have it. And there will be also, also today a discussion regarding uh, uh, hackathon. And I think initial discussion was to have a hackathon in July. So it, as it will, not, it will not be a physical meeting, and we, anyway, we can have uh, a virtual hackathon, something under discussion. So we'll also discuss today in the group what uh, we could do. Uh, we uh, we hope that maybe in November we can have a, a physical meeting, but of course at that time nothing is uh, uh, decided for that. If it, it would be face to face or online. Anyway, as uh, we we are used now, so we'll continue with uh, monthly virtual meetings, uh, meaning that we'll have another one in June before the uh, virtual IETF meeting. And of course, uh, we have always a mailing list, and we have set a number of uh, uh, platform. I mean, number of uh, accounts on different platform on uh, GitHub, on uh, Google Docs, if used, for example, for the. Uh, a challenge document, um, and uh, so we'll continue with uh, this uh, mode of operation uh, as uh, as written there, and uh, of course, just you can use any kind of uh, of the different uh, tools that we have to communicate with the group. Okay. So. Uh, if there is no comment, I will also go now for the next item, which is about the uh, uh, challenge document. So just to remember to, to all that, uh, so we, we started this document to list and have a documentation about the different uh, challenges regarding the application or the use of AI in our domain of network management. Um, so last time the status was we we basically started based on on discussion we had in previous meetings. Um, we started with some challenges in the document and with uh, an initial table of contents. Um, and we share this, and of course then there will be a kind of call for contribution to this document. Uh, I would like to thank all the contributor, future contributor, because a lot of people reply positively. 
but uh, did not have time to, uh, to to contribute to the document. But at least it looks like we are, we are now in, in a good shape regarding that we have a small team that can um, support the document and with uh, his input. So that's very nice. And here today, I would like to, to present, of course, a bit the discussions that happened uh, in the different comments uh, when people read the document and contribute to the document, but also uh, we can uh, discuss a bit more and uh, if people are, have opinion on the different part of, of what I present here, uh, please be feel free to, to interrupt me and, uh, and, and tell me your, your feedback. So uh, looking at the update and the document, so as I said, so there were some discussion and some proposition regarding the, uh, let's say, introduction of the document, uh, because of course, before going directly into describing challenges, we wanted to have some kind of introduction. So initially it was the introduction section, I would say, was uh, focused on objective of uh, artificial intelligence uh, for uh, network management. Um, and uh, there, was, there is a proposition maybe rather than going from uh, saying that we know the objective first, maybe focus or highlight the problem, uh, I mean difficult or hard problem we, we have in our domain and see how uh, AI can help. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, I personally think it's, it's very related, it's just the way you present. So rather than saying that uh, there are different objectives to solve this and this and this problem, it may be uh, more better motivated if uh, we start describing the very hard problem uh, we can have in, uh, in our domain. So there were some problems actually that have been documented already and at least uh, listed. Um, for example, everything related to resource allocation with NPR problems where you have heuristic that are not optimal and so on, can, is, can uh, AI can do better and so on. And uh, although it was highlighted, I think, uh, I mean, you have all this problem of scalability, accuracy of our techniques, but also the problem of, uh, of uh, the, the bottleneck, in particular, human bottleneck, we have in man, many operation, network management operations. So we need human, uh, we might op human operator to, um, uh, still a lot of human operation to do. So <clears throat> this is the, I mean, this was, uh, uh, so this new section was proposed before, then we go into the uh, goals. Um, so as I said before, we need to find the right, let's say, articulation between the two sections or the right link. Of course, there is clearly a link. Uh, it's not yet fully uh, define if we need to, or two or one section, but anyway, we need to to motivate maybe with the first two and to then go into the uh, second one with the goals. Uh, here we have a lot of, um, let's say, comments and discussion, how we should organize, because of course we should not put uh, for each objective one, 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 I mean one paragraph and just each after each. Uh, but we should somehow organize uh, the section, maybe classify the different objective, a kind of um, yeah, structure around the objective. At the beginning, we, we, we just say we can maybe go through by, by layer, but of course, it's clear that there are some transversal layers, so maybe you need to have something per layer of classification of the objective, but still, all the objective uh, transversal to different layers. Or maybe there are also some uh, taxonomy that, is, uh, that uh, exists in our domain that we could rely on to use and see in this taxonomy, maybe find, uh, uh, use this taxonomy to, to classify uh, the, uh, the different objective where uh, AI can help. Uh, that's a possibility. But another possibility is that, okay, maybe we can start with a kind of, uh, we, uh, everybody can just contribute with uh, what you are fishing uh, about, uh, the, um, uh, about the objective of AI for network service management and try to find common it's an attribute. So maybe it's in the first case, it's taxonomy and the same taxonomy is more uh, top to bottom. It's more bottom up approach. Okay. And um, uh, and then, yes, this is so a different way. So it's not yet fixed, of course. So here, just to give you a bit what are the status of the, let's say, discussion. It's a virtual discussion because it's mostly by comments in the document. 
But of course, here, if you have any other idea, oh, we should organize a bit the, the, the goal, and, uh, this section of the goals of AI for NM. Uh, it, would be, it would be good to, to hear from, from you as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, Laurent, right? Yeah, Jerome. So, yeah, it's nice to see that there are, uh, I mean, people willing to contribute and already uh, several comments that exchange on the document. Uh, relating to, to what you ask about this uh, presentation or organization, I think, I think it will be okay for the moment to, to, to work with based on um, what people bring as inputs. And I would say gradually think about the, the best way to, pr to present that. Maybe for me, I see it currently as being a draft. We have ideas about sections, but we, we should remain a bit flexible and uh, even if it's not completely stable now, if it's a goal or if it's a motivation or uh, problems, I think it's a bit fluid and we should maybe keep it like this uh, as we mature our thoughts about the, um, about the document. So I, I would not see as, uh, as a, a big issue uh, concerning that we are still at the beginning of this document. Maybe when it's a bit more stable, we can rethink a bit more the, if the initial structure of the first section needs to be uh, reworked. Okay, thank you, Laurent. Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, I agree. Uh, and I think maybe it was a kind of a small error because I think in the initial table of content, we actually put kind of a, a pair layer objective. But uh, of course, at this stage, we are in the early draft and we can easily then consolidate uh, different things into something else, uh, with more structure. If there is no other comment, we will move to the next slide. So uh, here, I just leave the, so this is, of course, the core of the document will, will be the challenge description, so challenge themselves. Um, as I said before, we, we set a list of challenges that have been identified in previous meetings, in particular in side meeting during uh, previous IETF meetings. And here, just report uh, the ones that have, uh, are no, a bit more, um, let's say, I mean, for, for which we have contributions or comments. So one is uh, regarding uh, lightweight artificial intelligence, if you want to embed into small devices, like, of course, uh, routers, switches, and so on. Uh, this is something that actually has already been proposed. And uh, I mean, I've already described in, a, I think, one month ago that we have this. Uh, there are no, not so much update regarding this. Um, uh, we have some contributors that are interested to, to contribute, but not some more update on the content itself. Um, okay, we have some uh, some comments regarding uh, and one another challenge was also and I think it's uh, it's a bit reflect the um, a bit the, 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 the technical presentation before. I think one one big issue or challenge is that we have people uh, the, that are not a necessary expert in artificial intelligence and we need somehow to. To be guided to, I mean, to, to, to guide them to use artificial intelligence if they want to use for a networking operation, right? So we have also identified this problem. Um, and it was more on if you want to use artificial intelligence, what should be the algorithm to use uh, for your problem? And uh, of course, maybe the, the two sentence uh, description of the challenge was a bit very uh, too strong. And I think it's an, I also agree with the comment we received is that uh, probably finding the right algorithm is probably too strict. It really depends on the number of parameters. Uh, so you, because you can say that if you want to, I don't know, to detect attack to predict the next, uh, uh, to the, the next uh, traffic throughput on your links, it, it's not so easy that to say that you should use this or this algorithm, right? So maybe we should uh, come up here with a, a formulation of the problem, uh, how to select or how to find the right trade off uh, between the uh, accuracy you want plus the constraint and so on. So, I mean, it's kind of a, 
methodology for helping somebody not really expert in artificial intelligence to set the the uh, the problem and help them to refine his view of what what should be then maybe is the best fit for its own problem of the algorithm. Uh, Alex, you want to to say something? Uh, no, sorry. No, sorry. I, 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 I just, I just joined. joined. Oh, okay. So yes. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, so then the third one uh, that has been proposed is a new one is uh, regarding the automated network data labeling. Um, so, so somebody that has been that is uh, that has been written and that has been described here is that for many cases I think we, we know we all, uh, always always. Uh, we already have the problem of data that we, we put in the challenges, but more than just having the data, uh, most of the time it's also hard to have data with labels that can be used for supervised learning. So uh, here the challenge is more about, okay, so probably today, uh, I think it's it's not so so it's so difficult to have data. I think if you are if you operate your own network, so you can easily extract data from the different probes and so on. But of course, then if you want uh, to do supervised learning, uh, because many techniques today are more really, more focusing on supervised learning, then you need to have some levels of your data. Having only the data is not enough. And uh, nice, I think, nice discussion is that of course uh, you can say that you have data from one side, and then you have problem uh, from the other side, and the same data, of course, can be used for different problem, uh, but should not be at the same level, or same level can be used for different problems. So, so there is not a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between the labels that you can put on data and the problem. So it, it can, it should be adapted. So it's more exactly what I put here, just fill the gap. You assume that you have uh, telemetry or monitoring techniques that allows you to have data. Okay, that we can assume that you have, and then you have a problem, and that we may need to fit the data to this problem, in particular regarding uh, the level. Of course, there are other, uh, I think, other issues regarding the data, uh, more related to the, I would say, AI technique itself, like, uh, you know, um, uh, pre-processing normalization and so on. But I think from a, 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 an objective perspective, uh, I mean, you need the label if you want, I mean, regarding the problem you want to address. Uh, then there is a question, of course, regarding although the uh, the online monitoring and control of the quality and of, and property of the estimators. Uh, so yeah, but always the question is that usually you have algorithms that can work nicely with uh, some offline data set or on testbed, but then it's very hard to guarantee that they will uh, continue to be uh, enough accurate uh, and there let's say, uh, under a long-term perspective, like uh, it's important to know if you put an algorithm in place to, for example, to automate some uh, some operation in your network, you should know how long you, your solution or, or, uh, can be applied without, for, for example, reapplying learning and so on. So it's important to know at a certain point where when your uh, AI technique is not any more accurate and that your model is not any more accurate. And it's also something like, uh, of course, there are problems that are not speci only specific to us, but we should, I think, for all uh, all problems, try to figure out what is the specificity of the problem in our domain of network management. So uh, we have also to think about that. For example, here, maybe we have, of course, we have systems that we cannot uh, just uh, stop and restart. Uh, and, and so, so um, uh, and for the yeah, and for the first one, of course, regarding the data as well, I think we already identified this the problem of data in general. But if you want label as well, it's really, uh, I think it's very hard in our domain as well. Uh, yes, Albert. Thanks. So I was uh, listening to to your presentation, and and also I check on the. I read the document, and I, I, I'm one of I'm one of the ones that said that was uh, going to contribute, and I didn't do it yet, but I will. Um, and I was thinking that also regarding Jose's presentation, the document has 
uh, to some extent, a non-written underlying assumption that AI will be applied to a network and training for that AI will happen on that network. And um, I was thinking that that's a possible scenario, uh, but a different scenario is that training happens at the vendor lab and the AI works on the customer network where no training, there is no training. So probably, uh, I don't know if we, you, you think it's relevant to consider also this kind of a scenario? So, so you mean when you just basically, uh, is it, I mean you, when you, you train a different uh, path, right? I mean, different network and as you, as you basically as you present, like uh, it's related to transfer learning, right? Um, maybe I, I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, it's it's similar to transfer learning. Yeah. But if, if we if we think about it, right, many of the neural networks that we use every day, like in our phones, have not right. been trained in our phone. Right. The, the, our phones come with neural networks that have been already trained and are, and that's it, and we use them. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of a scenario, which I guess it makes a little bit more sense from a vendor perspective. Yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying that this is the only valid scenario at all. I'm just saying that this is another scenario. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I think it's good. Yes, of course we, we can uh, we can check in the document or uh, how to make. Uh, I think uh, to well, I think as a challenge we should uh, have it, and that yeah, if you can uh, contribute with uh, Jose, it will be it will be really nice. <laughs> right, happy to, and happy yeah, to trigger some discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, to follow up on this comment, I mean, uh, this is the a perfectly fine situation. This is uh, something we, we are doing. I mean, I'm speaking uh, on behalf of Nokia here. Uh, we, we have development of model uh, on, on our, I would say, uh, internal infrastructures. And when we deliver models to, uh, to customers, um, I mean, this is kind of based models and they need to be, uh, I mean, fine tune or train to the specific uh, operational uh, environment that, where they will be used. So this is a, a fully valid model, what you were mentioning. But you mean fine tune or, or, or retrain? Not necessarily retrain. It's the, in fact, you can have a base, uh, a base model, which is the output of what we have trained on our uh, Training data sets. Uh, usually, we have um, it's, uh, we have relationship with customers to to to, to get some some trained data set. But once the operator is deploying uh, the specific solution, there is a phase of uh, specializing. So we, you see, when you instantiate, you you will have uh, some level of uh, adaptation of the model to the actual deployment. Mm -hmm. and, and this could be. Uh, I mean, you can have, uh, if, if, let's take when you have uh, some AI algorithm that are running for, for base stations. Uh, you can have a, a kind of master model that is that reside in some, some places. And when you deploy it over, uh, I don't know, hundreds of base stations, each of the instances will be specific. Uh, they will be closed because they rely on the same master model, but each of the model will be specific. Then you have also some issues for, but this is more uh, software engineering, but you have issues for or model management and, and versioning of, of those uh, of those machine learning models, even if they belong to the same master model. That's cool, right? Because what uh, if I understood you right, what you're telling me is that it's not a binary. Either you train on the vendor's app or you train on the operator's network. But rather, there is a it's a it's a, um, there are many degrees, right? You can fully train on the vendor lab and then don't do anything on the operator, just inference, or there are degrees in between. So maybe we could reflect that. I never thought about these degrees in between. So maybe we could also reflect that on the document. This is Alex, just, just as an FYI. So basically, this is the topic of transfer learning. I think this is very valid. And there was actually at NOMS, sorry, no, I am last year, uh, the best paper dealt with exactly that topic. It was a topic on best um, on transfer learning, which was written by uh, Ericsson and KTH, I believe. With, just to, because we are getting into a little bit into the academic discussion, with GNN, you don't need to do transfer learning. 
the model should work on, on an unseen scenario without transfer lag. Then I agree with you. Then the, the real world is super complex. Uh, and I understand that in many instances, you will need to adapt, modify, or do your own stuff to adapt it to the real world scenario. But GNNs are not transfer lag. It's just a model that works. But I agree, with transfer learning, you can achieve similar results. Yeah, so yeah. it's interesting. I mean, you might come back to the to your presentation that GNN is a kind of a generalization, basically, of, uh, of the... Exactly. Yeah. So before GNNs, you had to use transfer learning. Now with GNNs, you don't need to. Yeah. Very broad statement, but more or less is correct. You mean GNN specifically or uh, other uh, families of neural networks? GNN specifically, they can general, generalize to any graph, even if they have not seen. So if your learning is based on graphs, which in computer networks is very traditional, you don't need transfer learning. Yeah, as you say, if the problem fits with a graph representation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to take too much time for this discussion, but yeah, I think it's an interesting topic to be, um, to be brought uh, in, in the uh, discussion for the document. Uh, just to reflect that um, we, we have also um, investigated to combine, in fact, uh, a deep reinforcement learning. In fact, even, yeah, based on neural network plus reinforcement learning plus transfer learning. Uh, for, for, di for different usage, it can be first to, um, depending if you have uh, available data or not, so you may reuse uh, in your train train model um, and apply it to the target uh, to the target domain and you can use it also to um, as an assistance to the operator uh, if you want to be able to to, to plan or to deploy uh, similar models into different uh, regions or different uh, um, part of your network but they have a good level of similarity uh, you may have also indication on uh, how much gain you can expect uh, from from the transfer learning of re reusing existing model versus, uh, I mean, training a model from scratch, uh, and, and the, the cost associated with uh, training time, training uh, training resources, etc. So this is why I was I was asking if it's very specific to GNN, uh, because in our in our investigation we we show that for um, uh, deep reinforcement deep reinforcement learning plus transfer learning you can also get uh, very good gains uh, on on such application. I don't yeah, think it's, not, it's exclusive, but I, I was uh, I was curious about uh, GNN. So my understanding is that maybe I'm missing something. I'm not saying anything bad about transfer learning. I think it's a valid technique. I'm just saying that with a, a GNN, you don't need transfer learning because it is already understanding what a computer network is. So if it is a different computer network, even if it has not been trained for that specific network, it will be able to understand it. I think that those are different techniques that apply to different things. What, which is strictly true is that GNNs do not make any sense if your input information is not a graph or, or it does not have, uh, it, I mean, it can be a graph, it can be a graph with features on the link, features on the nodes, whatever, but a graph. And um, just to finish, my understanding is that if the input information is a graph, then GNN should provide superior performance compared to any other technique, including transfer learning. If your input information is not a graph, then I think that there are many other techniques that you can use. I don't know if I'm clear or not really. Clear for me, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jerome. No, it's, it's okay. It's nice to have a discussion. So thank you. Okay, so maybe we move to just the two other uh, items on this slide. Uh, I think you can still see my slide normally. So we, we had two propositions for IBM IBM sorry, related uh, challenges. So I would say it's good because we make also some uh, connection with, uh, of course, the uh, IBM agenda we have in the group. Um, but also maybe we, we, we have to see if it's uh, not, if it, this item must be IBM specific. Maybe it's more my personal opinion, not because when I read the, the document, uh, so, somehow I would say that it's not necessarily IBM specific. But so the first one 
This is more related to an interpreting high level or natural language intents. So it's uh, it's more related to use uh, NLP or uh, techniques or a named entity recognition technique from NLP to to have a better interaction with human. So it's related to also human in on the loop uh, challenge. Um, uh, so I think uh, one, one, one question arises uh, uh, is, of course, you can interpret intent, uh, but uh, can you also generate intent from current operation or can you use uh, this to help in diagnosis or uh, in the other way that rather than the user is providing intent, the, uh, I mean, the intent of, of kind of intent, I would say, or human, let's say, high level or human readable uh, information operated to user based on uh, a diagnosis of the network. So it can be, I think, it's, it was in the comment, can be seen the two, two directions. And the other one, I think it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very nice, but it can be more generalized than only uh, IBM, it's basically, the so rule is how you define your action plan if you have uh, an intent. So what should be the action to, to produce but it is a desired outcome that is expressed in the intent. So as well here, for sure, uh, I think uh, it's uh, very, um, I mean, it's kind of having us, uh, I mean, looking for something 100% uh, automated is not possible, but basically it's kind of the goal that we would like uh, to have something that is completely, let's say, autonomic, autonomous or whatever. Uh, but it should be, it's a, uh, of course, it's, uh, it's really part of the uh, challenge, um, challenge of AI for network management. If you can, uh, mostly you just provide some inputs, what you want, and then produce all the action needed to, to have this output. But yeah, that's basically what had been proposed as a new challenge. Uh, so there are still, of course, in discussion. So I just present you the status now of the discussion. Uh, but of course, if you have any uh, any comment on that, uh, you can also give your feedback. Okay, otherwise I'll just move to the last slide about that because uh, I think we, we have then to move to the next item. So then just more uh, some, uh, yeah, some, um, some, in terms of how we can continue to progress. So I think it's good, as I said before, that we now have, a, let's say, a list of identified interested contributors. So I think we'll continue uh, with this group with more maybe active discussion with specific emails and maybe meetings to continue to consolidate the document. Of course, uh, everyone uh, is welcome to participate. Maybe I will, I will let's say, flood a bit less the mailing list for asking for contribution. So we'll continue to, uh, we will continue to present the status of the document during meetings and everybody can con contribute. But as I said, maybe we'll have more dedicated meetings and email mailing list between the contributors. But yeah, if you want uh, to be uh, to be added to, to them, it's, it's uh, fully open, of course. So basically we'll continue on, uh, on the same, uh, with the kind of same process. So with the uh, with shared document, uh, uh, where we have still some comments, so we have some discussion in the document itself. So it's kind of the, the it's kind of a document plus comment plus discussion. Um, so it's it's very nice because it's very uh, interactive. Uh, and then there will be the question of the format. I think up to now we can continue to share the document. Maybe um, something that we already uh, uh, say last last time is that we may think on uh, of what should be the, the good outcome of the of the document? Uh, can be a white paper or can be a draft and so on. So probably, um, I think we disc I discussed with uh, some some of you uh, and uh, what uh, what is the, the outcome of the discussion is that uh, the draft. I mean, if you put that in a draft, it can be good both for the contributors because it gives visibility to this work and also to the group because here, of course, we have a shared document we present in the meeting. But if you have a, a draft that is visible, it also it, it can be also very good, which does not uh, then avoid another another format. If you want at the end, if you want to to have this in another format, but at least it gives some visibility to this activity in the group, and I think this is also very good. 
And yeah, I think for this, uh, that's it. So if you have any other comment or question. Uh, Jérôme. Yes. If I understand correctly, the idea will be to organize dedicated meetings, yeah. um, like drafting sessions on the document. Is it correct? Yeah, correct. Uh, but this will be publicly announced on the mailing list. I think we should try to keep the link with uh, all participants of the research group. Yes, we, we can. We can. We can announce publicly, of course. I think the idea was uh, for meeting. We can announce it maybe for emails because if you have discussion by email, maybe I don't know if it's good to to flood all the mailing list. I mean, if you just discuss internally between the let's say author of the document. Um, uh, at least I think if we if we'd like to be able to involve as much people as possible, yeah, maybe flooding uh, with. Uh, too many comments, too many discussion will will uh, we will lose the the, the track. But uh, I think we should try to be inclusive in the sense that if people can see that there are um, some momentum on the document, that uh, there are some specific topic or issues being discussed, uh, this we, I think will we we will still be able to include um, everyone willing to to participate. Because if it turns to be a bit more to uh, to dedicated meetings, then uh, it's difficult for people that are in a kind of listen mode to, to be aware of what's happening. So maybe there should be uh, some announcement about, uh, okay, the next meeting will be, or the meeting will be every two weeks uh, on this uh, slot, and then maybe provide a quick summary of uh, the main technical point that were discussed so that people, if, if they feel an interest to, to get involved, they can at least uh, get the high level summary to, to know what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no problem. I think, as I said, it's really open. So just to to avoid fooling people with uh, emails. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, okay, so next point is uh, now regarding the discussion on IBM architecture. So Laurent, I let you uh, leading the discussion. Yes. So uh, as, the, as discussed already a couple of times, uh, I think you're all well aware we have um, a work plan defined in energy concerning activities for internet-based networking. Uh, a couple of those work items are already uh, pretty well covered, and there will be a point on the internet classification activity at the end of this meeting. Uh, but I would like to highlight uh, three topics that uh, also have been shared on the mailing list uh, before this meeting, and we would like to get your opinions and see what we could do uh, to move it forward. So the first point is on the uh, IBM architecture or archi architectural considerations, uh, which is work item number four. Uh, I think you can read the, the description. This is not the main uh, elements of discussion today, uh, but more on the considerations. Yeah, thank you, Jerome. Um, so we, we shared on the mailing list uh, a set of points uh, to, to try to steer a bit the discussion on this. We had already uh, in the past uh, several documents uh, that are now expired, but also some pre technical presentations from uh, research group participants. Uh, and, and I think uh, we would like to, to be able to trigger um, activity on that and, 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 uh, and really um, make progress. So, um, so on the consideration, the, the idea is that uh, we should um, concentrate on uh, clearly identifying for the architecture document or documents, uh, the problem statement and design goal challenges and principle and requirements. So essentially the, the last part of the sentence for the uh, principle and requirements, what, what is important to consider for the scope of this architecture document. Uh, the second point on uh, it should be really intent specific. Um, the goal is not here to, to design another uh, very uh, general management framework, but to, to capture uh, this how, uh, because intent is essentially how you do something and capture that from an architectural point of view. Of course, uh, try to aim, and, uh, aim for simplicity uh, in the architecture, flexibility of uh, our design, make it also extensible and uh, think about the integrability of uh, our proposal with other uh, automation framework or automation um, aspects that are being developed in other groups uh, in IETF, but also other uh, other standardization activities. Uh, 
Um, I was an advocate to uh, try to investigate if uh, using principles from service-based design, service-based architecture uh, could be beneficial in making this, uh, this aspect of being flexible and extensible, uh, but this is more a, a specific consideration. Uh, I think a question that was raised several times that very important is uh, to clearly define and agree on the scope and system boundaries of uh, what we consider to be the scope of this, uh, where this architecture should apply, what is on top of this architecture, what do we plug uh, underneath, and what is uh, below this architecture. <coughs> Sorry. Actually, what, what are we controlling uh, or interfacing with, uh, with this intent-based system? So I think this is uh, essential questions we need to clarify uh, at the level of the research group. Uh, in order to to make sure that uh, we output the right types of document um, uh, for, for this work item. Uh, also, what are the typical user types uh, that should be considered? There is an in, a draft on intent classification that um, address uh, the, those questions of types of intents and types of users. Uh, also, technologies involved. So I think uh, that could also be inspiration from from this uh, from this document from this work. But I think from the architecture point of view, this, this scope, this boundary question is essential in order to, to avoid, uh, I mean, specifying the wrong thing. Um, then there is the question if uh, we should be aiming for uh, use case specific uh, type of IBM architectures, or if um, we should really try to come to an architecture that could be applicable to the most uh, number of use cases or more generic uh, common functionality, common building blocks uh, as part of this architecture, and whether uh, these uh, these questions raise some um, uh, notion of trade-off uh, to find in order to, if it's too general, general maybe it will be a bit uh, less obvious how we can apply it. If it's too specific to some specific use cases, then uh, it's not portable to to other uh, uh, to to other applications. So this is also an important question to consider. Uh, the the next point is uh, IBM coexistence with uh, legacy management system and emerging management automation technologies and frameworks. So this is related to what I, I mentioned before with this integrability. So um, either greenfield complete greenfield deployment and integration with uh, new uh, new approaches for automation, or also uh, if we have a existing deployed system or legacy systems, um, how the architecture and the functionality we aim to provide can also um, interface and operate with those uh, those existing systems. Um, so there is then uh, interop the question of interoperability between different intent-based systems. Uh, let's imagine that you, you deploy uh, this uh, this architecture or you follow this architecture and deploy the functionality in different domains uh, from a single or multiple operators. Um, they may not be fully homogeneous, so the question of uh, interoperability, interoperation first, and interoperability between those different deployments uh, may be a question to, to investigate and, and document as part of this initiative uh, in the work item. Um, then the energy proposition, uh, what is our, uh, I will say, uh, clear positioning? There have been already other attempts in other groups, uh, in, in open source also, about proposition for um, uh, reference models, architectures, and different forms of, uh, of frameworks for, for, for intent-based networking. So what, what is our clear, uh, clear differentiator here, clear value that we want to propose? Um, and of course, I say connection with related draft and presentation. This is to, to say that uh, this is not beginning from scratch. We, we have uh, in Indian Energy at least uh, a couple of, of different documents and presentation that we can use as a basis. So the point here is to get a bit um, your opinion, uh, what, what we sh how we can try to bring this work forward uh, in the research group. Uh, now it's your time that you... <laughs> supposed to say something. Laurent, this is Luis. Uh, 
mentioned maybe the, the possibility of driving this through the use cases. Maybe that, that could be because maybe considering an architecture in, a, in abstract terms, probably a, a little bit more complex to, to understand in what would be the, the specific necessities to, to be addressed. So probably going through different use cases could help to, to understand what would be the, the needs, the kind of information that is required, the kind of procedures, and the kind even of, of elements to, to, to check and consider. So maybe maybe that would be the, the vehicle, let's say, uh, a, a more clear view of the necessities for that architecture and, and considering that uh, start up kind of architecture. Right? Okay, thank you. Um, Olga, I see that you're in the chat, you're raising your hand. I don't know if it is for for these questions now or is it some, for something else? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, so I have two points uh, in regards to that. I do think, of course, uh, you have to start from the problem statement uh, requirements and use cases, but the question is kind of do we go with some kind of generic use cases or specific use cases? So in terms of the, uh, when you say here, should we consider use case specific IBM architecture or try to have more generic common architecture? When you say use case, do you mean uh, like, you know, in terms of provisioning closed loop, uh, things like that, or do you mean different solutions like, uh, for example, 5G or, or uh, um, different or optical or something? But what, what would you consider with use case in, in terms of? Because you can approach it with a generic common architecture, you can also approach with generic use cases. Yeah, I, I don't have a specific uh, preference here. Um, especially because I was thinking about some use cases. Uh, this is the, the next point in the discussion um, to, to suggest potential use cases uh, that are different from each other so that we can learn different things and identify potentially commonalities. Uh, I'm not sure they will qualify as uh, very specific use cases, but more um, generic ones. Mm. Um, but as I say, I don't have a clear preference uh, what should be the process to, to try to derive this architecture. What I would like to see happen is that um, manage to deliver uh, a document or a set of documents that is uh, valuable in the sense that um, it, it's reused either in the research community as being a, seen as a reference. So that it means that we are quite complete and, and, and useful in what we um, in relevant in what we have identified as being the key component and interaction of an architecture. Uh, and also could be reused, I would say, wider in the industry uh, as some guidelines uh, to understand uh, what, what is, uh, because I don't expect that this architecture will be uh, only a one shot, that there, there will be, I would say, derivation of those, of those, uh, of those potential architecture so that uh, people to really uh, develop solutions and make implementation out of that um, can use it as guidelines to understand, okay, we have those key functionalities uh, to develop and uh, there have been some guiding principles, some um, uh, key, um, key aspect either from data structure or from uh, the type of interactions and the type of mechanism that should be uh, thought about when we design the system and this should be a kind of help to those um, implementation. And, and also with the goal that um, ultimately, even if we are done doing standards in the research group, um, that this is a, 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 a stepping uh, stone to, uh, to help towards interoperable uh, internet-based system. Because if you have multiple vendors, multiple solution providers uh, developing uh, their solutions, we, we can still also aim to have uh, some level of interoperability between different functionality or between different systems. Uh, if we can contribute to that, for me, this will be a, a very good goal of this architectural discussion. This is why I was also considering very important question about the scope yeah. and, uh, and, and what, what is, our, what is the, our value proposition. You see, because if we, re, if we redraft a complete architecture, then we will just compare to what the others have done. 
and then it's uh, it's just a matter of maybe they will be, we will have more um, momentum or adoption we don't know but if we manage to say this is something that was missing this is clearly addressing a gap or a need i think that may really contribute to something of value because uh, compared to thanks for that but compared to the you know what we did before in the standards in terms of the use cases and different architectures you know the main difference here is that we are bringing all of those two cases together to support the intent based approach so for example in other standards like tmf mef or whatever they they could kind of pick the use case and say and prioritize it and say okay i'm looking at provisioning now but i will have it monitoring would be later or assurance would be later for us what we are bringing with intent driven or intent based approach is uh, uh, putting that all that together and supporting intent driven life cycle so from that perspective uh, <clears throat> specific use cases if you are saying oh we'll support this or this or this uh, may not be possible we have to kind of bring them all together to support intent driven approach on top of them So this is Alex. I, I have one com one comment, just one add on uh, comment, Laurent, to your original question uh, regarding uh, whether this should be use case specific or, or generic. Uh, my opinion is uh, this talks about an architectural framework. I, I would think actually this has to be general. Uh, it cannot be, we would not want to have a different, a separate framework for, for each different use case. But having said that, I think it would be beneficial to say here's a general framework. And here is how it gets instantiated for different use cases. So perhaps have uh, ha have a have a set of use cases uh, there which are basically used to 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 basically exercise the framework and and, and verify that they can be uh, yeah that uh, how they would be applied to those use cases. Hundred percent with Alex. Yes. So, so another, uh, Marino speaking, another point to take into consideration would be that um, if, if we um, uh, follow specific use cases, right, and derive an architecture that is, has a specific scope, right, we may get into the, the trap of doing something quite similar to policy-based management, that the solutions were quite customized to specific sort of use cases, right? So I'm, I'm also pro a generic uh, sort of architecture. I would agree as well. Okay. Uh, ju just and, and just another comment I want to say, I'll be quick here. Uh, I do believe there is already some material uh, from different uh, stakeholders for the architecture. So maybe you can put it in, in uh, some place to, to have all those materials together. Yeah. Uh, are you referring to previous drafts and presentation? Yeah, or yeah. we have previous drafts, presentation, just some slides somewhere where, where everyone can see what's already available. So maybe if there are already some things in those drafts that could be reused. And Okay. Just coming back to this uh, generic or general uh, aspect of the framework, for me, um, it still will be very important to define uh, what I call the scope of the boundaries, because uh, if we are talking about uh, ICT systems, uh, I can imagine, for instance, an internet-based system being deployed for uh, uh, IoT, I mean, a home system or uh, you know, whatever uh, IoT uh, type of, of environment, which could be very different in terms of type of intents and uh, functionality involved then uh, if I'm deploying in, a, in a, to the core of a, a large operator for 5G systems. So for me, when we say general or generic, um, I think it will be beneficial for us in the energy to say, is this in scope of what we consider to be applicability of the framework? Even if we, maybe it will, it will be applicable afterward, but at least at the beginning of our design process to say, uh, we consider this to be in scope, because this is where we will exercise uh, the design, and this is out of scope. The same it can be, I mean, horizontally in terms of, uh, I will say, type of technology or a type of use cases, and can, it can be also vertical, I will say, where do we start and when do we stop? I think in the presentation from Marinos, uh, the, the, the southbound uh, boundary was on 
uh, as soon as the management the intent based management system was outputting interfacing towards uh, for instance sdn controllers um, mano etc so th those were considered to be uh, out of scope of the the intent based system and we were interfacing with those uh, there are uh, intent based systems that consider purely sdn so i think we should really clarify the positioning of this architectural work uh, in terms of scope because otherwise we may first not share the same understanding of what the scope is so it will be difficult to agree on the uh, on the design and then uh, for the applicability and, and uh, as uh, as alec was mentioning trying to exercise the um, uh, the, the deployment scenario uh, if it's uh, not in the scope of what we have designed first, it will be difficult to, to make this exercise. Sure, I agree the scope needs to be clearly defined, uh, but scope is uh, different from use case, right? That was the uh, earlier question. Yes. Yeah, but it would be defined by use case. Yeah, I, I think it depends also how we would like to proceed. Uh, there is some usual uh, approach to say um, we we expect a scenario or user story use cases, and then we try to derive requirements out of that. And these those requirements help to drive uh, the scope and uh, the functionality uh, of the architecture. Uh, another thing is to use use cases a bit like Alex was mentioning that um, we. Let's say we have an architecture and we want to uh, explain and, and, and try to exercise if this architecture is fitting to some typical use cases. And then we see the adaptation process to go from the generic architecture to a deployed architecture. Uh, it can be the same set of use cases for, for the two parts of the process. Uh, they could be a kind of fully bottom up approach to say we, we just take uh, a ground set of, of use cases and uh, we identify commonalities to, to derive. Uh, and the, the common functional blocks and interactions. So I think this notion of use cases um, can be taken from a slightly different perspective also, depending on how we want to, to use them. Okay, so also for, for the sake of time, um, what I got, I, I think we have also uh, our minute and recording that, that will help us, but I, I heard uh, several inputs. Thank you for that. Uh, we we'll try to summarize that uh, after after the meeting and come back to the research group with uh, some with a sort of proposal to move this forward. Of course, uh, everything will be contribution driven, so this will just be guidelines at the level of the research group to uh, try to see how we want to address this uh, this work item uh, on IBM. Uh, but um, I think uh, we already have some uh, some indication of uh, what people will be willing to uh, to do and how to do that progress this work. So let, let's move on to the next uh, to the next slide, please, Sharon. Uh, and I think we, we partially touched that, even if here the discussion will be uh, slightly different too. So the second point is on the IBM use cases. Uh, we have also a specific work item dedicated to that, uh, essentially towards validation scenario and use cases. Uh, for intent expression and function, then to assess the quality and completeness of the, um, of the specification. Um, so, in, in the considerations that we have shared uh, partially in the mailing list and with some of the, the, the people involved in, in typical uh, uh, use cases, um, this is a proposition that, uh, that we would like to make. Um, potential use cases of interest, um, this is Again, an open list, and we have to see uh, who will be willing to contribute to that. But at least the way I see that is you can have kind of uh, typical use cases that will be in different settings. Uh, potentially a 5G or slash network slicing type of use case, because this will represent certain set of actors. It can be a vertical industry, um, vertical actors, uh, the telecommunication operator or multiple operators and typical types of infrastructures in support of that. Uh, the second category could be around enterprise or data center networking, because this is could involve different types of actors. 
the type of infrastructures and problems that are faced from an operational perspective uh, could be quite different or complementary at least to what uh, could be in the first category of use cases. And finally, uh, the last family or last uh, typical type of use cases could be more towards a smart X. Uh, so this could be for typically digit smart home, smart city uh, that will involve again uh, another type of, um, of actors. If you take, for instance, a digital home type of environment, you may typically have the user uh, uh, of the system that are no have no qualification, no technical qualification on the operation of the network. So. Uh, the type of intent and the type of operation is expecting from the network uh, and the automation level could be quite uh, different from um, if you have, for instance, specialists that are from a telecom telecommunication operator that are here to operate and the type of intents uh, could be quite different. So my idea will be uh, to encourage to have um, at least to have a discussion in the research group and maybe identify uh, those uh, families of use cases that can come with uh, different characteristics. For me, this will be interesting to see uh, if we come back to our previous discussion, uh, how well uh, this generic architecture uh, may adapt and fit, uh, be applicable to these different families of use cases. But of course, uh, I think the, the, the ground truth about the, this use case is that we need to have um, participants that are willing and capable of uh, progressing those use casing, those use cases uh, as part of the work of the, of the research group. Um, that said, I think we also have uh, more recently a, a concrete proposal uh, coming from uh, from Luis and Panagiotis on the um, transport slice intent, which is a bit targeted uh, to be a specific uh, application. So I think this could be also a basis of uh, of the discussion on the use cases uh, in the group and see. Uh, if there are other participants willing to, to join them, or if there are other uh, teams, participants that are willing to develop additional use cases. And so to have more than one use case, we can play with uh, and learn from uh, in the research group. The second bullet point in the consideration is, uh, again, a proposition uh, from the chairs from the, uh, for, for the research group um, to potentially define guidelines and uh, common structure, common expectation, and even eventually a use case template in order to help support uh, the development of this activity. Um, we have seen, for instance, uh, experience in other groups that uh, if there are several use cases that are proposed, if they share at least a common structure, this could be useful uh, for the comparison, but also to, uh, to stimulate and help in the uh, reduction of, uh, in the writing of, uh, of the use cases. So, this is something we, we could provide uh, for the research group if this are interested into that. And um, I think there is an important connection to be made with the, uh, the document, the work on intent classification, uh, because in this document, there, there is underneath uh, the classification, um, uh, bottom-up approach to have those uh, different technologies, user types, intent types, uh, that, that is, uh, I think, uh, would be a quite uh, obvious uh, relationship with uh, the work on use cases. So if you have, I don't know, opinions, things you would like to propose, comments on this uh, work item, it will be fine to read. Thank you. If there are not so much comment on this, um, uh, something I would like to share with you is um, we had some offline discussion with uh, Luis and Panagiotis about their, their, their proposal. They have a draft that they have uh, presented a couple of times now in the, in the research group. Laura, um, I think from the beginning, um, the, the beginning of discussion, um, I have a feeling that the, the framework will be mainly driven by the use cases, right? Am I, am I right? Which work are you referring to? The, the general work on IBM? Hello. Yeah, maybe you can go on. Yeah. 
the, the, the framework will be driven by the use cases. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if is that, is that the case. So and maybe if you can talk, talk, talk again. What I was about to say before maybe uh, made uh, this comment was, um, so there is the work from Luis and Panagotis on transport license uh, that is uh, aligned with a kind of use case. This will be developed further uh, as part of the work of the research group. Um, so we, we have discussed with them about uh, positioning this work at least uh, as a kind of use case document. And um, we have also interactions uh, with uh, Jefferson, which is uh, one of the research group participants and secretary of the group. Uh, based on his previous experience uh, at the time of uh, Anima and the, the work of autonomous networking uh, as part of energy, there was a, a set of use cases that were proposed uh, with a common uh, common structure uh, to try to, um, uh, to, to st or stimulate the discussions. And uh, Jefferson was one of the few that um, um, say took this uh, this activity really to the end, his publication of uh, an RFC. Uh, highlighting the, the, the specific use case he had proposed on uh, violations. So I think we, we could benefit from the experience of, of your person uh, at the time of autonomic networking in energy and see, uh, I mean, we, we have asked Jefferson to, if he was willing to kind of let's say, organize some discussion around these use cases, uh, as I say, based on his experience and try to see how we can stimulate this work. So we will uh, make the, the connection with uh, Luis and Panagotis uh, for, for this first draft, but we expect also if you have interest into that, a bit similarly to what we have for the uh, research challenges in AI, uh, to potentially dedicate specific meetings uh, on, on use case discussions so that uh, we, we may also trigger uh, some interest from, uh, from more than just the, the, the current one involved into developing additional use cases on, on IBM. Okay, so Jerome, we, we, can, we may move to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, just for the sake of time, uh, we are a bit um, overdue. So the, the last point of uh, this IBM discussion is on implementation and the uh, activity around Akaton. Uh, so we have another work item uh, in the IBM work plan, which is dedicated to implementation and proof of concept. We had uh, last October a dedicated meeting and first um, very nice interactions, uh, proof of concept uh, demonstrations, and some um, uh, outcome we wanted to 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 deliver further. Uh, so so the idea is is to uh, continue on those uh, on this thread of activity, and we have again shared on the mailing list and asking now for you about a set of considerations. Uh, what are the expectations, the objectives um, for from the activity around implementation? Uh, on internet-based networking and especially uh, kind of hackathon activity, uh, whether we should also combine with first work on, on documents. Uh, so typically, for instance, the use that we just talked about uh, and the architecture, and at which stage we need to, to really consider, um, I would say, put more emphasis on the, on the implementation and development of, of prototypes for, for IBM. Um, how can this be organized and developed? Um, virtual hackathons, virtual teams uh, with uh, dedicated uh, platforms to, to support this uh, using the GitHub, etc. So, whatever we can make available from at the level of the research group, we will try to, to support. Um, also, who is willing to take part in this activity? And there could be uh, different types of participation. Uh, actually, develop uh, the tools and the demos, but also. Uh, you may also want to provide um, some uh, uh, development environment or infrastructure in support of the simulation, etc. So uh, your participation is not only to, to develop code, there could be also some other uh, form of support. Um, also to uh, help us in you know, uh, planning a bit uh, how we see this activity and moving forward, uh, it will be uh, good to have um, understanding of how much resources uh, you may be uh, capable of putting in this activity for the next uh, upcoming months. And um, 
we we would like to a bit for like for the use cases try to organize dedicated calls uh, with interested parties we think we should at least try to share this common understanding of what we would like to achieve with this implementation aspect of ibm and um, uh, see if this if we can move forward with this one and also typically what kind of outcomes you expect uh, from the short to, to long term uh, from very individual i would say simple types of code type and demos to more integrated and also more, I would say, comprehensive type of reference tools and frameworks. So, defining clearly our objectives and, and mode of operation could be uh, the, the two main aspects here um, in order to, to at least give us from, from the support of the research group what we would try to, to give you in terms of organization of meetings, access to the GitHub or other collaborative platforms and uh, understanding uh, your requirements. on this so uh, Laurent just to, to be sure so the, the um, implementation to the use cases that we could well, use cases in the architecture that we could work out in the previous work items or do you foresee something that could be running on parallel not necessarily link with the with the other work items, just to understand what, what is your perspective on this, on this. So here, it's just uh, uh, my thought. I mean, not necessarily as a, as a research group chair, it's just that for me, I, I can see a lot of flexibility here. What we had in October was really, we had we made a call for demo as part of, uh, of a conference dedicated to uh, an energy IBN uh, topic. And we got uh, four, four, four demos not correlated to each other. And we already had, it was already a very good basis of discussion and further has a lot of potential for further activity. So, and continuing in that sense, for me, will be already uh, quite nice, but we also identify potentially that there could be um, connections between part of the tools. Uh, for instance, one was providing uh, part of the functionality to, uh, define intent and maybe some do some verification on intent etc with an interactive and interactive approach uh, some other demos were really more on the um, uh, I will say a derivation of intent into specific uh, NFB, NFB based systems or SDN based systems some other were related to um, or were having specific functionality that were not seen in order like a calendaring or scheduling type of functionality so that they could be depending this is really dependent also on what the teams uh, are willing to do and how much effort they, they would and interest they will see in collaborating together but i think having individual demos not necessarily linked to the architecture or to the use cases is possible if they are linked to the use cases and the architecture i think this is more consistent for our work but i don't want to create too much dependency or burden to make this happen uh, having also connection between the different demos or, or uh, I mean, proof of concept could also be a plus because then we, we have more pieces of the puzzle together and we can work also on this interoperation and adaptation function between the different pieces. So we, can, we, we may also be able to demonstrate a more complete uh, intent-based system that just uh, with individual pieces and maybe also some factor of reusing components between them but this is also putting, you see, additional constraints because you need more coordination. You need to uh, comply maybe with some specification from the other tool. So I think it's really a matter of what the teams will, will see as uh, their own interest and the shared interest. So for me, it's, it's broad um, and we have to see what people are willing to, to go into. But again, just coming back on, on one thing, if you see this, this notion of a hackathon, a virtual hackathon, um, I think this is uh, a bit different because uh, for me, I will see this as kind of event, uh, an event in time where we, we really want to say, let's bring together a, a set of participants, set of teams, and try to discuss and work together on a common uh, output. Uh, whereas I would say the, the, the default um, background activity could be more. Uh, uh, I will say more independent, more flexible. If, if we if we gather for a specific hackathon, it means that teams uh, are willing to, to to contribute together, and the goal is the the collective contribution. 
And we have to see if, if such a type of virtual hackathon is something that pe the people involved are willing to do and invest into, uh, or if this is not practical for some reason and we, we take it out of the, of the picture. So, um, also in this, uh, globally for, for all these different discussion items on IBM, uh, Jérôme, myself, we will make uh, some summary of, of the output of this discussion and make um, a feedback to the, to the research group and uh, maybe some recommendation of what you expect to, to, to happen. And um, we, we will use that as a uh, as next step to proceed. Jérôme, you can move on to the next uh, slide or next. Yeah. You want to take over, Jérôme, or you want me to make the, the update for that now? Um, I, can, I can take over for this uh, if you want to. Uh, so the last item is regarding the classification draft. So as uh, discussed in the last virtual meeting, and uh, so we, we requested the author to do a last round of Command D for requesting the uh, call for adoptions. I think uh, we are now we are now in the process to to send as a mailing list the call for adoption for this uh, document. So as uh, they actually uh, ask for our comments and address some of them, and they explain that we address the user in the next iteration. And uh, we were waiting for the of course for the go for all the authors of the document. So we, we got it uh, yesterday. So in the next uh, yeah, next today or tomorrow, basically there will be the call for adoption sent on the mailing list, and so uh, I, I think everybody then can uh, give their feed, uh, feedback for the adoption on it. But of course, we can we have a few minutes, so maybe if the uh, if the uh, uh, maybe Olga want to to say something about the about the last comment, or I don't know. It's, it's open, maybe you have a few minutes if you want to share something, Olga. Thanks. Uh, I can I can maybe just say, you know, add a few additional things, like, you know, that I think we addressed the comments that were received online and offline. Uh, there were some comments that maybe uh, it was not possible to, to address because uh, it was about whether this draft is uh, relevant or not for some the stakeholders, they said maybe uh, they have a bigger comments. They said that they addressed by other drafts. Uh, we asked for the adoption. We got some comments. Thank you. Additional comments. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Yahi and Magdi, for the new comments. And uh, uh, our initial pr uh, proposal is that we uh, we replied on those comments, but we also have a list that we created for the comments that we will address in the next version of the document after the adoption. So. We created that list that we will address uh, in the future. So uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't go back in what we changed and what we added. I think we presented it several times and discussed around it. So maybe it's quite late now. So I wouldn't go information at this point. Okay. Thank you, Olga. So yeah, said so the, the call for adoption will be uh, will be sent on the, on the mailing list. But uh, maybe maybe just uh, uh, for the chairs uh, that that is the only thing like that uh, it would be important just maybe to get your feedback about some of the things that we addressed based on your comments. Yeah, by the way, uh, thank you for the reply. I got the reply from the author. Uh, but I have a question. For example, if I want to kind of uh, argue with them or have more. Uh, should I do it like um, like directly, for example, to Olga, or should I send back to a reply on the mailing list? Like, uh, the, the, I am one of the co-authors, and uh, because uh, some authors are in China and it's quite early in the morning for them, I'm here. But there are also other co-authors. 
the list. If, uh, just for example, if I want to reply again to the email that I received for the questions, uh, for the reply, like if I want to argue more, like, you know, interact more with the authors, uh, like should I send you, for example, an email directly to the authors or should I send it back to the uh, mailing list? Maybe it's uh, uh, maybe it's always better to send us a mailing list because then um, you can also all other people can see and also interact and uh, so on. All right, fair enough. Okay. But maybe I can just ask verbally uh, the chairs whether the uh, whether we address their comments in the way that they're happy with it because uh, we try to engage all the comment authors. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have time really to get deep in, in reply, but I'll uh, get back to you by email for this. But yeah, thank you very much for the uh, for the feedback, uh, the reply. Thank you. Okay, at least the, the way I get uh, Olga's comment is that, uh, yes, you, you made good work to, um, I would say, Take into account the comments, uh, be clear about the communication, uh, what were the proposal. So this is very satisfactory from our side, and this is why we think if the document is not ready for a second call for adoption. Um, yep. So for me, and maybe a, a message that I would like to convey, this is really a chair to, uh, but this is applicable to any research group document, uh, not only uh, specifically to this one is that for me, an important uh, change is that once the document changed from being an individual proposal to a research group proposal, um, it becomes the, the, the baby of the research group somehow. And then uh, we say collective responsibility, and especially from the authors that now become, um, I will say, initially they were, it was their own thoughts that were uh, providing inputs as part of the individual documents. Now they are becoming editors of the document on behalf of the research group so that uh, they have this additional responsibility to make sure that what is reflected in the document uh, reflect the consensus of the one that are contributing to this document. Uh, and do, so now the one that are contributing to this document is not only the original author, but uh, needs to take into account the, the comments and the views from uh, from the other participants that are actively involved into this document. Uh, I think this is um, something to be uh, well well aware for uh, for, for the conclusion of, of the research group documents if they need to, to, to progress to a, to a RSG uh, review. Uh, that uh, This is really a, a, being the job of a research group document and editors of a research group document um, to make sure that the, the document is uh, to the best quality and, and, and fitting the, the, you know, the scope and purpose that it was designed for. Further comments on um, this discussion item number five on the internet classification or more generally any other business for the meeting today? Jerome, you have something else to, to add before we, we conclude our meeting? Uh, for me, that's fine as well. So I think the people... For me too. Okay, good. So I think we can close the meeting. So thank you to all. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the good inputs. Thanks for the nice uh, presentation, technical presentation. Bye. We will Bye. talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Have a nice uh, weekend. Bye. Goodbye.